So I'm just looking in the window of the flow hive here and this was an experiment where we got some wax from the brood box, just scraped it off the top of the frames and pressed it into the flow frame surface. A trick some people use when they're getting a bit impatient and they want to see some more action on the flow frames when there's a weak colony like this one and not many bees in the box yet. And you can see here the bees act wax and redistributing it on the surface of the flow frame. So there's covering it all in wax and, and uh, connecting the joins together. You can see in the middle of the screen here the little bridges they've made to join the comb parts. And then on nearby you can see the gaps left. So it starts off with gaps and the bees do their amazing job of completing the cells and eventually draw it out further. So uh, there it is in action, watching the bees recycle wax inside the hive. It's very cool that they recycle, recycle the wax. And I'm just looking around the apiary a bit here and you can see that there is some nectar coming in. So that's exciting because it means the bees will actually build up and start populating this box and start storing some honey. If we open the, the side windows and have a look, we can see what's going on. So this morning is our live Q&A for beginner beekeeping. No such thing as a silly question. It's time when we especially encourage anybody to ask all of the questions that they might be afraid to ask. Because in the end, we all start off as new beekeepers and there's no such thing as a silly question. It's just about learning from each other. And if you know the answer to somebody's question, by all means, jump in and answer it in the thread so that uh, we can all help each other learn. So you can see here, we've got cap uh, honeycomb and because it's in this kind of random pattern you can see that they've actually gotten hungry and chewed away the cappings and then eaten the honey and that's what they'll do when they need to because honey is there to store for times when they they are hungry and they need those resources to continue their hive but now what's happened is there's nectar coming in and if you look down the bottom of the cells you might see some glinting nectar in the bottom of the cells. So that's a good sign. They'll fill them up and cap them. So this frame, because they've partly eaten it away and started to fill it up, will actually be a multi-floral flavour. Frames like this, you'll often get two-tone honey coming out into your jar. When they're filling up and you've got like a, a good flow on, you can get uh, the monofloral flavours separated, often frame by frame. This one will turn into a bit of a, a mixture in the jar. It's a beautiful thing. So if you're just tuning in, this is the beginner beekeeping, no such thing as a silly question. Get in there, answer those questions, you ask those questions you're afraid to, to ask. And if you know the answer to a question, chime in on the thread. Let's help each other learn about bees. Oh, great, Cedar. Um, so a lot of people joining us in. Someone just asking, Chris is asking, how do you know when to install the super cedar when you, um, when, if your brood box is ready or not? Okay, so it's best to wait for, if this is the brood box down here, if, if you're new to beekeeping, we call the, the box down here the brood box where the queen is, where she's laying eggs and there's pollen stores, there's larvae and there's usually a bit of honey as well. But the, the frames uh, often start off just empty. The bees then do their amazing work building their wax. And only once the frames are all built out and the bees are using all of the frames, and when you see a lot of bees on top of the frames when you open the lid, that's when you add the super, which is the honey collection box or boxes. You might like to add multiple boxes, but in this case, we're just adding one flow super on top. So wait till they're all complete and there's lots of bees in there. This super was put on too early. As you can see in the side window, there's not many bees yet. So we'll be waiting some time still. We're in a pretty temperate climate here. The nights aren't too cold. I feel like hay about leaving this box on, but if you're in a place where you've, you've got freezing temperatures in the night, then I would recommend taking that box off again, just to make it a bit easier for your bees to keep the, the brood nest warm because they actually 
keep it at a specific temperature because when they're raising their young it has to be it's about body temperature in order for the young to survive so it gets a bit harder for them to control the temperature if you have empty boxes on top so if it's cold take your supers off if the bees aren't really using them Cedar, Tom's asking, and I think just because you're on that super box there, um, trying to encourage his bees to go up into the flow frames, and I know we've done that on that super. So. Yeah, so, so that's one easy trick. In the end, lots of bees in your box and an active flow is the recipe. I, re I don't do anything else apart from just wait till the bees uh, have built up. But if you're getting impatient, scrape some wax from the bottom box, which is exactly what we've done here, press it into the flow frame surface, and you still might not get any action, but once the bees are ready and they've, they've built up a bit, they'll come up there and they will recycle that wax into the surrounding area. You get to watch that. As you can see, they haven't used anything over here, but where we've put a blow of wax, they have used it. And you can even watch them chewing away at the last bit of wax here as they prepare. Now the bees have noticed there's a bit of nectar flow coming on and they're getting prepared. But for the last month or so, they actually haven't touch this area simply because there hasn't been the the resources it hasn't been nectar for them to bother preparing cells and producing wax and getting ready to store honey it's amazing how they throttle the colony they'll even shrink down the queen will lay less eggs when there's no flowers around and that way you haven't got this big population eating the last of the honey it allows them to to last longer through those times when there's no flowers. Thanks for, thanks for your questions. We're, we're doing the begin of beekeeping Q&A today, so ask the questions you're afraid to ask and we'll answer them. Also chime in on the thread and help answer people's questions. Great, Cedar, they're, they're firing questions today and we've got Fred Dunn, he's joined us again. Um, someone's um, adulations is saying that they did a little honey harvest and a little bit of honey was leaking. Is that, does that cause a problem? Uh, generally not. The, um, when I used to harvest in a conventional way, I used to spill a lot of honey in hives because you're opening up lids that have got all honeycomb in them, you rip them off and there's honey dribbling everywhere and the bees are good at cleaning up honey. So if you're in the situation where you've harvested, I don't have a, a good example here, you can see some nectar coming in, but um, sometimes, depending on the way the bees seal the frames, uh, if and there's so many dynamics here actually, where the bees um, might have eaten out the the lower section of frame and replaced it with a with a honey that's um, got a different viscosity than the one above. Perhaps the, the honey up top in the frame wants to move down quicker than the honey low down. And, and you might get some spills coming out the sides of the frame into the hive. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it, um, the bees are good at cleaning it up. If you do have issues or you feel like there's excessive um, spillage in the hive, do get in contact. Having the right slope on the hive is important. That's why on the Flow Hive 2 we put a level in the side. The level bubble should be in the middle. Probably easier to see on this one. Uh, there's a little level bubble there. So you want to adjust those adjustable feet till it's in the middle. If you've got the classic hive, then you want to keep it nice at the level base because the uh, slope is then built in to the baseboard, the correct slope. And it's surprising, you might think, yeah, yeah, I've done all of that, but we've even had very experienced team members here who have harvested and not noticed that the front of the hive's sunken a bit and they get a big spill because the, the um, Hive sloping the other way and the honey's w wanting to uh, flow not out the back here but everywhere. Um, so that, that's a, a good tip to remember. Um, but if you are having issues, get in contact and uh, just try one or two frames and um, that way you, you've only got a little bit of spillage in the bottom. Flow Hive 2 has a big tray underneath so any spills will go down there rather than sitting inside the hive. Um, it's a little bit more efficient too to harvest say uh, every second frame in the hive rather than all at once because if you harvest this frame 
than the bees will use the remaining what's left in it because you never get 100% of the honey draining out of the frame. They're pretty good, the flow frames. Most of the honey does drain out, but the remaining bits and also the, the wax capping they could use to finish off the next frame. So if you're sort of, sort of uh, checkerboarding it and doing every second frame, then it's a bit more efficient as well and also limits um, if you do have spilling issues how much there is in the hive. Great, so the Harmony is from the central coast New, um, northern New South, New South Wales. Just they've had a lot of rain down there and they ended up with quite a little bit of water in their tray. Is that all right and what's the best, what do you think, do they, should they just empty it? Yeah, just empty it out. What happens if you've got a lot of rain is the, especially if it's driving in on a bit of an angle, it'll hit the landing board and it'll splash in. And typically if you've got the tray down here, we'll just slide that out so you know what I'm talking about. Here's the, here's the pest management tray. We've got a bit of oil in this one, but uh, you can get water building up in the tray if there's a lot of rain. Just tip it out, give it a clean out and put it back in. If you're sick of that, you've got a lot of if you don't want to do that step, you could always run the tray upside down and the water won't uh, collect in it anymore. Depends on, on it, whether you're using the tray. But generally, a lot of debris and, and gunk from the hive builds up in there, so it's good to clean it out from time to time. Great, so there are a few people just commenting on our hives and just wondering what um, we've actually used on that Flow Hive 2, the one you're on now, the Western Red Cedar. This is a linseed oil from the local hardware store here. It's actually not a straight linseed, it's been um, cut with some solvents so it really soaks in. Um, it's, it's okay. Um, some people are having great success with like decking products. They want a really long lasting finish, but they often provide a tint to the hive, so it depends what look you're after. The, um, the, the decking products will last the longest because that's what they're made for. Uh, but yeah, they do have that tint, so it's a, it might be a bit of a brownie colour, your hive, instead of looking like this. I do prefer it like this, but it's a bit more work to keep it this way. Every, every so often, six or 12 months, you need to give it a little bit of rub and another coat with the linseed oil if you want to keep it looking good. You're always fighting a little bit nature outdoors. You don't want to turn it sort of a grey colour like wood goes naturally. And, um, but then you can't see all of those beautiful grain lines. So um, yeah, some people just don't put any coating at all and they can just let it go kind of silvery grey. It'll take a couple of years to look at nice silvery grey. In the meantime, it'll sort of be halfway there and not look quite as good. So I prefer just to use the um, oils and give them a bit of TLC from time to time to keep them looking good. And also see the people noticing that we tend to paint our roofs, is there any reason for that? Yeah the roof really does cop the, uh, the weather and, and debris also falling. If you just leave the roof uh, without the paint you'll find that it, it'll, it'll grey or go kind of uh, mildewy the quickest. So. It's nice to really protect that roof and also limits the amount of um, sh uh, expansion and shrinking it'll get in the changeable weather and it'll create a better seal. It's nice to um, get lots of paint in, in the joins to create a weather seal or even, even better still, a little bit of silicon as you put your roof together to try and make sure that uh, water's not coming through the shingled boards into your roof cavity. See, so the, where you put the flow tube, the little channel down there, is there got any tips on how people should clean that channel out if they need to? Ah, uh, yeah. So down here, some, I can't see it here now, but sometimes you get a bit of honey build up. Depending on the way your bees are finishing off those cells, you can get some seeping coming through, or perhaps last time you harvested, you um, didn't wait for the last remaining drops and you put the cap back in and there was a bit of honey build up. Now we've got a little leak back point in, um, in here. In fact you can see just a little bit of honey there if I put my finger in. So there is a bit of honey that's dripping into that trough area and there's a little gap there that allows that honey to go back to the bees to recycle it. And that's how you want it to be so you don't get build up in there. However bees will be bees and they'll block up that little, little leak back point 
and you can get a bit of build up in there and it could go fermented if you're in a tropical climate or candied if you're in a cold climate and you might like to clean that area out. I rarely do but if I notice that it's getting a bit manky down there I'll get say a, a, uh, a clean dishcloth and I'll put it on the end of my kit and just poke it up there and give it a bit of a clean out. So when I say key, I'm talking about this, um, the key we use to open the frame. So this one here, if you imagine putting a bit of cloth on that, it's the perfect length to go right in this area here and clean it out. So then you can add a bit of uh, warm water on the cloth if you wish. If it's really um, dirty for some reason, then you can actually put your tube in and then just squirt a hose into there. Don't hold it on there, you don't want to flood water into the hive, but just squirt some water up there, let it flow out, squirt some water up there, let it flow out, and that could be another way you could clean it. Generally you don't have to, the bees do the work. If you find that leak back point is blocked, then unblock it by putting your tube in. The tube we designed a little tag on so it automatically cleans it out each time you harvest. But if the bees have blocked it, then you can even just use the end of this to just push into that area there and uh, that'll just remove the wax or propolis that the bees have put there. Great. Cedar, um, someone's asking, have you got any nifty places where you store your flow key on the hive or do you just leave it in the garden? Um, we just leave it in the garden. They're made out of a nice material that doesn't seem to rust and I just put it like that. Um, <laughs> but you can and we have done it in the past put some little hooks on the hive and you can actually uh, just just those those little hooks that screw in you can buy at the hardware store and you can just hook it on the edge there if you'd like to nice look at that it actually yeah. sits it actually can sit there sort of might have to be oh <laughs> nice <laughs> Perfect. Cedar Tanya's in south of Victoria, and for those of you not in Australia, that's quite cold for us here. When's the best time to add a queen to a new hive? So it's a little bit early here in Australia, especially in where you are. We're, um, we're attempting, we're, last week on Facebook Live, we performed a split of a hive because we've got some activity here in this more subtropical region. And, but it's still a bit early. We didn't see any queen cells. Better off waiting till spring when you know this flower's coming, you know the hive is gearing up to, to, uh, to, to really breed up. That's the time when you want to be um, either changing your queen or, or taking a split and introducing a queen into the split, um, things like that. However, if you've lost the queen, there's no queen at all, then there's, you really have to rectify that situation or your hive will die out. So if you get in there, there's no sign of any brood no sign of any eggs or larvae, then you'll need to buy in a queen if you can, that's the fastest way to get going, or get some resources from another hive that has a frame with brood and eggs on it and hopefully they'll make a queen from that. Shannon, um, another person in Australia I think is asking, any prep or housekeeping they should do to start to get ready for spring for their, with their hives? Spring's an exciting time, bees really breed up fast, so it's a good idea to, to get your kit, get your hive together, get, the, get it painted, ready to go. And um, it's nice to have a, a second box uh, waiting in the wings in case you, somebody's got a swarm and you get to go and catch a swarm. And uh, that way you're all geared up and ready, get your frames made. So beekeepers yeah, conventionally, conventionally will um, spend the winter tinkering away, getting boxes ready, nailing together frames and things like that. So they're ready to go when the spring's there, the bees are, are really breeding up, there's lots of flowers around and they can really uh, make use of that springtime and increase the size of their apiary and, and make sure they're um, getting their, their honey stores through that time. And we've got a couple um, obviously in America and um, Canada there coming into winter so they're wondering what should they do and that do they need to insulate their hive, wrap it up? Yeah, okay, a much debated topic and Fred Dunn who's uh, also watching would have better information than me. We don't get snow here, we don't get really cold uh, times but 
I'll just run you through a few tips for overwintering. Of course, if you ask uh, two beekeepers, you'll get three opinions of what to do. So there's arguments for and against wrapping hives in winter. Um, and those arguments uh, are uh, you, some people say the condensation's bad and it is if it's dripping down on the bees, but others say that condensation on the inside of the hive is important. It's an important water source as the bees aren't going to fly and they have some water in the hive that they can use. The um, others say, no, you should keep it as warm as possible. Some people even, even bring their bees indoors for winter. Um, I'm not sure quite how that works. Uh, and however, it seems like you can go either way and you can experiment. Ask beekeepers in your local area whether they do um, hive wraps and keep their hives warm for winter or not. Um, Michael Bush, who's in a, in a cold area in Nebraska, he just uses open mesh bottom boards and he'll dig his hives out of the snow in spring. He says the bees are fine. He doesn't even bother closing up the ventilation at the bottom. So, uh, so there's all different opinions of what people do. But um, so it doesn't really matter whether you insulate or not. It's more about having enough honey stores because the bees disengage their wing muscles, they vibrate themselves, and that's how they create warmth in the hive. So they can use the honey stores, convert that energy into heat, and keep the hive warm through those cold times, which is quite ingenious. And the, uh, the next thing is if you've got an excluder, which is the, the grid here between the two boxes, most people are running excluders, you could have a situation where the bees are forming together in a cluster through that really cold time and just moving to where the honey is to keep eating it. And if that cluster of bees moves up through the hive, up to here to, to eat this honey, the queen could be stuck below the excluder because she's too big to get through it. And she may perish in the cold below the excluder and you'll start the spring with no queen. So that's um, one factor to consider. So preparing your hive for winter, make sure there's enough honey stores. If there's not, then you may need to feed your bees, and feed them some sugar syrup, so at least they have something to survive the winter. And remove the excluder so your bees are free to move around the hive during that winter time. Some people take the flow supers off for winter other people don't, the, the, the supers won't mind the cold, you can leave them on if you wish, and, uh, but yes, moving the excluder is a good idea. Good question. Great. Uh, Walter's asking, this is a good one, I get asked this a lot on the phone actually, um, they've just, perch, just purchased a nuke from their neighbours and it's a bit cold, I'm not sure where Walter is. So just wondering, is it better to leave them in the nuke box until the days warm up or how long can you keep the bees in a nuke box? You can keep the bees in the nuke box for, for months. Now it's um, more a case of monitoring them if they're really building up and there's a lot of bees inside that box just kind of spilling out everywhere, then they're really after some more space. And they'll actually swarm if there's not enough space. So the idea is before they've gotten to that point, you transfer them into a bigger box and they can grow from that. But they are a functioning, a functioning little colony and they, uh, they will survive fine in the nuke box. The only thing to, to watch out for is that they're not getting too hot. You hear some devastating stories of people in a heat wave with their nuke boxes and the bees actually, all the wax melting and the bees dying just because they got too hot. So give them some shade. If you've got your flow hive roof, you could, you could put that on top of your nuke box just to give them a bit of shade during the, the really hot parts of the day or perhaps uh, give them some shade in another way. Great cedar. Um, any? Can you get um, wax from the flow hive, the honeycomb wax? You can. You certainly can. So, if you jump into the bottom box here, there's conventional wood and wax frames. Typically, on the edges, they've got uh, all honey without any brood in them, and it's a nice idea to cycle out those frames so you can get a bit of wax from that. And 
put some fresh frames in here in the springtime and that'll limit the swarming tendencies. That's one way you can end up with wax. The other way is you can either put another box on top here specifically for collecting honeycomb or you could uh, let them take the, the plug out inside the inner cover here and okay there's a bit of uh, paper in there um, so take take this plug out here you can see and that will allow bees to come up into the roof cavity and start um, producing wax in in this um, space however that can get quite messy so you might want to limit the space they have by putting perhaps say a tupperware container over this hole and the bees can get up in there and create some honeycomb for you in the roof cavity. Cedar, do you think bees and chickens go all right together? A woman, uh, a customer saying that they'd like to put their beehive near their chooks but they're just a bit concerned. Um, the people often keep bees. Uh, Fred Dunn watching might like to answer that question. He um, he's, works in the field of chickens and bees. They can be quite helpful. They can eat hive beetles. They can they can clean up things for you. They, um, however, the, occasionally I have heard of issues as well where the um, if you've got an aggressive hive, then bothering the chickens. So I don't have chickens myself, so I'm not completely sure. But if you know the answer or got experience, put it in the comments, and and that way that'll help you make up your mind there. <laughs> Good idea. Cedar, what's the best way to, like how can you determine if the colony does need feed, feeding during winter? So the, uh, there's a few ways to go about that, but ha having, a, having a look in here and checking on the honey stores is a good idea. So you can see here that there's honey stores building up, which is fantastic here in the middle, um, but it's still not a full box. I'd say this box is probably 40% full. Depending on where you are, here we don't need to leave any honey, any honey for the winter time because we actually, here we are in our winter and there's good nectar coming in. It often works better than the, the autumn for us here. So if you're in a, a cold climate where you know you've got a long winter, find out from your local beekeepers how much honey you should leave for your bees to survive the winter. It's uh, in, the, in the cold cold regions then it's usually you want to leave a whole box full. If you're uh, in extreme cold areas sometimes you need to leave two boxes full for your bees to survive the winter and if you don't have that you need to feed sugar syrup prior to winter to build it up. Ideally prior so they can store but if you've left it too late and you can't actually get them to store then you could keep feeding them through the winter. I've got some videos on how to make some easy feeders to go in the top of the flow hive. There's also some on the market you can get to, to uh, go under the roof here. There's a round one that has a hole that fits uh, into that hole in the inner cover. Usually the roof um, sits up a little bit or you can make bigger feeders and use a, a spare brood box to stick on top to house that and then the, the roof goes on top of that and you've got a whole box to make various different types of feeders in. And any um, particular ratio cedar if you're making a sugar syrup? So there's thick and thin syrups. If, if you've got experience with that, put it in the comments and, and uh, you can also look it up. There's lots of recommendations on thick and thin syrups and the thin syrup is actually uh, used to stimulate the bees to to the queen to start laying eggs and uh, it's kind of simulating nectar. The thick syrup is for them to store which is kind of simulating honey more so and they're more likely to put that in the cells and cap that off as storage. Great, Cedar, um, someone's asking that they've been having problems with robber bees and just wondering any tips on how to stop the bees from robbing out your honey. Yes, yeah, so it, in, when the bees get hungry they're more likely to rob but they only usually rob when something's gone amiss in, in your apiary or nearby. So if you've left um, some honey out um, accidentally it's not a good thing to do. The bees will, bees will go there and they'll find that honey and get a taste for honey rather than 
for going after the flowers and then they might go and rob out the weaker hives nearby and uh, it can actually kill a hive altogether if the rubber bees come in and take all the resources. They have these big fights and tussles at the entrance. You know they're robbing when the bees are coming and trying to get into all of the cracks around the place. So if there's bees all trying to get in here, down here and down here, and they're kind of moving in erratic patterns, then they're robber bees that are trying to steal the honey. Now if you see that, the best thing to do is close the entrance of your hive till it's just one bee wide. That way your colony can defend itself much more easily. The bees are trying to get through a very narrow opening to come in and rob the hive. So there's lots of different ways to do that. You, you can use bits of wood, etc. But one easy way is to use some grass or garden mulch. And uh, it's quite a good method because the bees will remove that over time and you don't have to um, go and remove the, the, uh, the entrance closure again. So you can just poke it in, in the entrance, stuff it in, and just leave a little gap for the, uh, the bees to come in and out. They only need, need it to be one bee wide and the robbers uh, will have a harder time at getting in. If that's still not working, then you could actually even put something over the entire hive. If you've got a really bad robbing situation, you can put a, a sheet or something over the entire hive and limit the bees actually coming till they've forgotten about it. Great, I have to read this one, Cedar. It's from Thomas, he's seven, and his dad has four flow hives, Matt. Um, they love going and checking the bees and helping dad with them. They live in Melbourne, Victoria, and he just wants to say thanks. Fantastic, fantastic, <laughs> it's great. Yes, we've got quite a lot of flow hives in the Melbourne, uh, Victorian area. We've got um, also my sisters down there keeping, keeping hives, and my uncle and my um, cousins keeping hives so it's um it's great and they get some beautiful different honey tones than we have here and it's nice to to be able to taste and share those flavors from from different regions yeah see so, when we we sell a six flow high flow frame and a seven flow frame and we recommend the seven flow frame for the colder climates what sort of temperatures um do you think are better for the seven flow frame so we don't really get the cold that other countries get here in Australia. Most bee books are written uh, and when they talk about winter they talk about deep snow. We don't really get that where we're keeping bees in Australia. We do have some mountains that build up deep snow but it's not generally where people are living and keeping their hives. So here in Australia you could just use this size hive which is the, uh, the six flow frames, which corresponds to eight brood, brood frames here. So it's the eight frame Langstroth um, brood box. Now, if um, I mean, I've been to Tasmania, which is our southernmost state here in Australia, and I've had one commercial beekeeper say, if you don't have three stack, 10 frame size, your bees will not survive the winter. And I've gone around the corner to another commercial apiarist and they've said, no, uh, eight frames like this is fine. I just have a brood and a super to survive the winter, fine. So you'll get all of these different opinions. It doesn't hurt to have a bigger size. So if you are in the colder regions, by all means, get the, the, the bigger size one. When you go into areas like Canada, then all of the, the size of the hives tend to be the biggest size. And you do get some really really cold winters there so just having that extra uh, extra frame of honey a couple of extra frames of brood will help your bees during those cold times. Cedar do you think that it's um, do you recommend when people are building the flow hive boxes do they need to use glue to make the boxes stronger? I don't use glue I just screw them together with the screws however you can use glue if you want to the, um, conventionally you normally glue boxes together uh, but um, I find it's not really necessary so I skip that step. The, um, the screws hold the boxes together fine. The Western Red Cedar Wood really does 
um, resist, it's got natural properties to resist rot. So, you, and the bees will provide a weather seal on the inside by propolizing the, the gaps. So it's not necessary to glue them however you can if you want to. Great, Marsh is wondering um, about cleaning the super frames. They took, they stored a few and they ended up with some wax moth cocoons. Can they just clean and reuse them and how would you recommend they do that? You certainly can. So, so it, wax moth um, will get in there, they, they like to eat wax. So um, just clean all of that off, just using a brush. The, um, the bees are incredibly good at cleaning, but give them a bit of a hand by giving them a bit of a clean first, and then the bees will get in there and they will uh, fix up and repair the cells and clean out any, um, any debris that's left on them. If they've gone a bit manky with, if you've left actually honey on them, and there's fermentation, that kind of thing going on on the frames, then use a hot hose. So you connect, a, connect to your laundry tap, get a hot hose and just hose them out, uh, shake the water out, dry them off in the, in the sun for a bit, and then put them into your hive. Um, because you don't want to feed bees um, fermented honey or give them dysentery. Cedar, with the, in terms of the, the timbers of the flow hives, and we've also got the Aracaria and the uh, Flow Hive 2 and the Classic, d would you recommend painting that rather than oiling it? I would. So, so uh, the, the only one I'd recommend just oiling is the Western Red Cedar. It's got natural resistive properties to, to mildew, although it will get a bit of uh, mildew in, in more uh, tropical climates um, and you'll need to give it a bit of a rub and a re-oil from time to time. But if you try that with the Aracaria or the Polonia, you might be disappointed because the mildew really does build up quickly and starts to, uh, it'll last uh, several months, but then it won't look so good anymore. It doesn't harm your bees to have it all covered in mildew. It's just aesthetically not so nice. But you can use, um, if you want to go that direction, by all means, uh, you can try that, but I would recommend painting the Aracaria or the Polonia. If you want to get mildew off a hive, you can use a product called Oxygen Bleach and just give it a good scrub with that and then re-oil or paint to get yourself um, back to a nice looking finish. Great. Elizabeth's wondering, do we ever harvest Manuka honey from our location? Um, not uh, specifically the Manuka, but similar. So, so there's around 180 different type of Leptospermum and um, plants and that we have here in Australia. One of those got transported to New Zealand um, some 500 or so years ago, I believe, and that uh, really populated New Zealand with the, the Manuka plant and they, uh, they get incredible honey yields off that, very medicinal honeys. But we also have um, other, others here in Australia that have medicinal properties. There's the one locally that gets called the jelly bush. There's an, another one called whitey eye. There's, um, there's lots of different species that produce highly medicinal honey that can be used for wound care. Great. Cedar, we've got a flow customer in Sydney. Um, they started beekeeping on the 8th um, May. Everything was going really well. Five frames in the super were all looking full. And then all of a sudden last month, all the bees just took off. Got any reasons or any ideas of what might have caused that to happen? That's pretty unusual to have the bees abscond. So, so you can get this one or to have the bees swarm. So if, if the bees are really building up, then the hive uh, will naturally divide and swarm. Half the bees will kick out the old queen. Sometimes they don't get it together to make a new queen and then you can get the hive dying out because there's no more eggs being laid. But it's very unusual to have a colony just leave for no apparent reason. So um, I'm not sure what's happened there. They normally wouldn't leave their babies behind. Yeah, it's a strange one. Um, Cedar, with the um, Flow Hive 2 and the levels, um, have you got any tips 
um, if you haven't got the adjustable hive stand on your classic to just try to make that hive level. So what you need to do is level the base. So the original hive, our Flow Hive Classic, which is still a, a great model, I don't have an example right here, but it was important to get the base you put the hive on level because um, that way the slope is built into the baseboard and it gives you the, the correct harvesting slope. So that's level in the sideways direction and level in the forwards and back direction. So if that's slipped over time, you'll need to chock your hive off a bit and find that level point. Now you'll need to use a level from the hardware store or you can download an app on your phone to find level and, and get it back to um, nice, and, nice and level front and back and side to side. And is the level seated because does the, the hive has the built-in slope towards the rear of the hive, isn't it? So the reason why we did that on the, the Flow Hive 2, let's just have a close look at that. Um, the reason why we did that is we found there was a common issue uh, where basically people would think they had their hive set up right and the slope was sloping to the wrong way or it had moved over time and people were getting big honey spills from the hive sloping towards the front when we need it sloping towards the back to harvest the honey. So we put a level in here when the bubble's in the middle then it's on the right slope. I'm not sure if you can see that, you'll have to get down nice and low. There we go. So you can see the bubble should be between those two marks and that gives you about a three degree slope towards the rear which is the correct honey harvesting angle. At the back of the hive we put another level which you can see in the cover here and that um, also can be used to find your side to side level which is important when you're letting the bees draw their natural comb because you don't want them going uh, sort of wonky across to the neighbouring frame if you can help it. Okay, but of course uh, you don't need to have those levels, you can use a level from the hardware store. Cedar, with um, people looking at our apiary on the video, is there, is there any recommended distance between the hives or do we have them set so that we can mm. get into the windows or could you have them closer? Or? So there's been some, some work done and Thomas Seely would recommend that you have, if you don't want drift between the hives and pathogen sharing between hives, that you have about a 10 metre space between your hives. Now, what beekeepers tend to do, because that's a bit impractical when you've got a lot of hives, is they'll, segregate, is they'll separate them in bunches. So they'll put a whole lot of hives close together here, then they'll leave, uh, leave a bit of space and then have another a lot of hives over there. And that way, if you get um, some disease outbreak, AFB, EFB or something like that, then you'll be limiting it to those hives. So if you have the choice and you have the space and you have three hives, then separating them will limit um, drift of bees between each hive. So separating them by 10 metres would be better and that way the bees aren't so likely to get into the other hive and share those pathogens. For really new beekeepers, um, who are just starting out with a hive, what would you rec recommend they do? Like, should they join clubs, do courses, register their hives? Yes, absolutely. So, so here in Australia and in other countries, it's important to register your hives. Here we're registering them with the DPI. We'll put a link in the, uh, the comments below. And there's a small contribution to make which goes towards helping manage pests and disease in the country. And there's some good information they send through as well so that's an important thing to do and that's a requirement here in Australia. Joining clubs is, is a good thing to do. Um, a little caveat on that, sometimes um, you get clubs that, uh, that are anti-flow hive for whatever reason. That's changing a lot these days because uh, a lot of clubs in Australia doubled, tripled in size when we started the, the, uh, the flow hive. So there's a lot of flow hive members in the clubs now. But for whatever reason, you know, for a lot of reasons, and I totally understand, you, you get some, some of the traditional beekeepers in there who like doing it their way and they're resistant to the flow hive technology. And so there's a little bit of a caveat there when you join the club 
to even expect some of the club members to have different opinions to us or to you and um, you'll have to navigate that but you'll find some club members who will be extremely helpful and it's a beautiful thing that beekeepers are so helpful to each other and it's an important thing to pass on the skills from everything we've learnt so far with humans working with bees for, for hundreds of years, even thousands of years, and to, to pass on that knowledge. So um, learning from others is fantastic. You can also uh, jump into a HoneyFlow forum and ask questions there. You can tune in this time each week and ask questions here. We've also got the beekeeper.org, which is a new initiative we've uh, started, which has experts from around the world uh, providing high quality training material, as well as, as well as us here providing training material. And uh, it's put together in a sequential order, aimed for you to start from square one all the way through to, to quite in-depth education in bees. So if you really want to handhold and you want to get stuck into it, have a look at thebeekeeper.org. It's free to try, find out what it's all about. And it's a, um, it's, it's a great thing. We've got lots of people really appreciating learning that way as well. Great, Kevin's asking, sometimes his, um, his bees choose to just leave some of the edges of the flow frames not full um, and the rest of it's capped. Is it still okay to um, harvest those, those flow frames even if it doesn't look like it's completely full? Generally, it's good to harvest when the capping's on the frame. Let's just come back and have a look at this window here. So try and gauge from your bees what's going on in the hive. And because I know they've been hungry for a long time, I'm not going to do any harvesting right now. So I'm looking at the back window and looking at the side window. I can see they've eaten a lot of honey away. So the rest of the hive's bound to look a bit patchy like this. So I'm gonna wait till they've filled it up and capped it more so. But when a frame is say 70% capped, you could take it if you need to harvest some honey or want to harvest some honey. If there is large areas of uncapped honey on the frame when you harvest it, the moisture content in the honey that ends up in your jar may be above 20%, in which case fermentation could occur in your jar when it's on the shelf. So that's what you risk. In the end, if your honey is a bit runny, a bit liquid in the jar, it'll always be a bit liquid when it's warm coming out of the hive, but once it cools down, it's still a bit liquid, then you'll find that you'll need to eat that honey. It's not the end of the world. You've harvested a bit early, but you'll need to eat that before it starts to ferment. No problem in my family, but um, if you're planning to store honey or perhaps sell that honey, then you want to make sure that the moisture content is lower than, than say, 20% to make sure that it's going to keep on the shelf. Cedar, just a few people just back on that painting of the hives, um, wondering do they have to do the inside of the hives? You don't have to do the inside of the hive, but you can if you want to. Uh, conventional beekeepers generally do paint the inside of the hive, it could make your box last longer, but I like to leave it perfectly natural for the bees. However, and we'll paint the inside of the window covers. That way you are uh, limiting the amount of moisture that gets in your windows and your windows are less likely to jam up when the wet weather comes. So I'll leave the inside of the boxes just natural and I'll paint the inside of the windows. Painting the inside of the roof is not a bad idea. That'll limit um, moisture getting into that roof and expanding and contracting. So you can see here, it, there's a nice seal formed, but if, if the inside of the roof wasn't painted, you'd find there'd be a bit of movement as the weather changes and it would crack that seal. And, and when it gets a lot of rain, moisture could come through the seal between the, uh, the parts here. Cedar Doug's asking, um, three, of, three of his brood frames have sort of grown together. Uh, or cross combed, um, mm. the hive looks level. What's the best way to separate them? Okay, it can be a bit annoying when that hap happens and it is a bit of a risk with going for naturally drawn comb or foundationless uh, frames. The, the bees 
we'll use that comb guide and occasionally they'll just go crossways, frame to frame, join it all together and you'll have to go through a bit of a process to separate those. A tip there if you're using a full box of foundationless frames is to inspect often in the beginning, make sure they're going straight and that way it, you don't have to go through the uh, cleaning it up later if they go wonky. Um, it's easy when they're building it just to push them back online if they're going bent but once they've really drawn those combs and connected them all together is, um, you're going to have to go through a bit of an exercise to untangle that. Now there's a few things you could do. If it's really bad you could even put a whole other box and put the, the, a new box of frames below and actually go th cycle those frames out of the hive, uh, let all the brood in them hatch um, or emerge from the cells and then remove them when only honey that way you're not disturbing the brood in those frames. Another thing you could do is pull out those frames, um, cut them apart and if you can't get the frames to, to sit straight or those whole sections of, of brood that are out of the frame you can use uh, rubber bands around the frame to hold that, that uh, brood comb in the centre of the frame while the bees reattach it. Around. Um, if uh, it's not a bad idea to pull the three frames out all in one block, so rather than trying to dig a frame out and it all breaking and you're kind of squashing bees as bits are, are moving around, if those three frames are stuck together, loosen them all up and pull the whole lot out together. And that way you can, you can work them, um, you can cut pieces of comb and separate them without having to, to um, sort of just, uh, roll the bees as you're trying to get pieces of comb um, out. So a few tips there. Um, once you get them nice and straight, then they'll follow suit after that. So uh, it's just when you're first trying to get them to, to go straight, you can run into issues. Having said that, um, I, I think that uh, it must be something like one in 20 hives goes a bit wonky for me. So I'm, I'm a big fan of foundationless frames because the bees get to do their perfectly natural thing and you don't need to go through that process of waxing, wiring or introducing other kinds of, of uh, or other wax from other hives into your hive and I find the plastic foundation um, necessary the bees don't like the plastic foundation as much. Cedra apart from the fermented honey maybe not tasting very good is it bad to eat it? Um, <laughs> you probably do. <laughs> mm, I tend not to I would make honey meat out of it so ah. Honey meat is a nice fermented drink, so it's certainly, certainly you can, can ferment honey in the right way. There's lots of different mead recipes out there, but if you're noticing you've got a bucket of honey and it's showing signs of fermentation, then um, you might like to turn that into a mead experiment rather than just let it ferment away. Oh, nice. Um, Shannon's asking another one from Victoria um, renting a house but may have to move is it a bad idea to shift a new hive um, more than 10 kilometers move it what's the best way to do that so that's the one of the easier moves to do is moving it more than 10 kilometers because the bees won't remember the new area and they won't um, go back to the old place so to do that you would uh, get up early in the morning before the bees are flying just before light and close the hive entrance now you can do that with uh, by poking some steel wool in there sometimes um, if there's a lot of bees you'll need to add just a wisp of smoke wait a few minutes for the bees to run into the hive and then close the entrance you can also um, use some wood you could screw some wood across there or use any kind of thing to close the entrance you'll then need to um, you could probably go back to bed at that point come back 
and uh, strap your hive up. So you'd be taking the roof off, you can leave that separate for transport and you'll be strapping the straps around your hive all the way around. Use those ratchet straps or there's an Australian invention called an M-lock which is specifically for strapping hives but uh, you, want, you want it to strap it down hard. You don't want it falling apart when you're transporting your hive. Give your hive plenty of ventilation. So make sure that this, uh, this cover here with, is vents in the top position. You could even take the tray out all together, provide lots of ventilation. Um, when you have your hive blocked up, you really don't want to starve them of oxygen. It feels terrible when you do that. I've learnt that in, in my uh, beekeeping career where you've, you've blocked up a hive for transport and they haven't got enough ventilation and a lot of the bees die in the hive when you've gotten to the other end. So a bit of a tip there, make sure they've got plenty of airflow. The screen bottom board makes it really easy because there's plenty of ventilation. Now best to use a, a trailer or, or the back of a, a pickup to transport that hive because you don't really want a bee hive inside your car. If you have an accident, nobody's going to help you if the bees are escaping everywhere. So um, transport them on, on a trailer, strap the hive down, move it to the new location, let the bees out and away they go. If you're going a shorter distance, uh, say, say less than four miles or six kilometres, then um, bees will fly back to the original location. So you can either move it more than four miles or six kilometres, keep it there for a month and then move it to the new location or you can use disorientation techniques which is what I normally do because it's a bit easier where let's say you might like to move your hive even just a hundred metres over there, you can put a whole lot of branchy material in front of the entrance or even taper a, a, an old shirt to the front of the hive so when the bees come racing out to start their day they run into these obstacles and they go wow something's different something's changed and that tends to trigger them to reorientate to that new location and less bees will fly back to the old location so there's a few tips there on moving the hive we have got episodes on moving a hive if you want some more in-depth information also the beekeeper.org will take you through step by step on how to do each type of hive move We've got a newbie here, Tricia, just wondering, there's lots of local bees um, in their area and just wondering, do you think, is it better to buy a colony with a queen or can they just use an attractant and hope the bees find the hive? So what you're talking about there is a bait hive. So if, uh, if you can lure bees into your hive, a swarm of bees into your hive, but it's probably unlikely. The best way to get started is to buy a nucleus, which is an already functioning little mini hive in a box this big. Get in your bee suit and your smoker, transfer those bees into your brood box, look after them and they'll grow. You can also buy a package of bees, which is like an artificial swarm that comes in the mail and you can shake them into your hive and away they go. You could also catch a swarm or you could take a split from a, another box and we've got videos on how to do each of those methods if you really need to, to, uh, to look at how to do that. Now, if, um, if you do want to try attracting bees to your hive, it's probably only going to work where you're next to a whole lot of hives and it's in the springtime when bees are swarming. So let's say you've got a whole lot of hives here. If you go a few hundred metres, uh, away then you'd put a, a brood box say six to twelve meters off the um, sorry six to twelve feet off the ground is that is that about the right height and you might put an attractant in there which could be lemongrass oil in a, in a little ziplock bag put a pinhole in it and that will mimic a pheromone which will attract the bees or there's also products on the market like swarm commander you could use to help attract your bees into your bait hive. So you can try it, but if you want to get going sooner, buy some bees and get going or take a split from a friend. Great, Cedar. Adam's asking, obviously hot from Long Island, wondering in, when it gets really hot in the summer, should they take the little um, 
the wooden plug out of the inner cover so the bees can go up into the roof? Um, that's not necessary. Uh, I tend to just leave that wooden plug. We're talking about this one here in the center of the roof. I tend to just leave it there like that. And that way you don't end up with the bees creating a whole lot of comb in the roof and it being a sticky big mess up here. However, if you want to try that, it's fun for a while for, to watch the bees building comb, but after a while you get sick of cleaning up comb mess. So um, I tend to just leave it in there. If it's hot, I would recommend uh, making sure they've got plenty of ventilation. The vents in the upper position will provide ventilation through and under the screen. Or if it's really hot, you could take the tray out altogether and provide maximum ventilation up into the hive. If you find the bees are really building up and there's a lot of bees, it could be a good idea to take a split and free up some space in your hive before your bees swarm. So that's what I would tend to do is take a split. Some people like to add more boxes so you could add another brood box or another super. That's another way you could relieve some of the, I guess, uh, overcrowding in your hive and help control the temperature as well. Great. Zeta, would, do you think you could clean out the uh, flow frames with a pressure cleaner, a water pressure cleaner? Um, you, you could. You could use a, a pressure cleaner. Um, to, to clean your flow frames. Generally the bees keep them good in the hive but if you've left them off the hive for a while and they've been in your shed and the uh, vermin's got in and you had a bit of honey in them when you put them in there and it went a bit mouldy then you might like to use a pressure cleaner to, to clean them off um, before putting them back into the hive. Or you could use a, a hose, preferably a hot hose from your laundry. Cedar, could you put honey frames into the soup, the six frame super boxes so you can get honeycomb um, like the hybrid setup, or is because of the rear access door, would that be maybe not such a smart thing to do? Yeah, I guess it wouldn't be such a smart thing to do because every time someone opens this cover, bees would come out because you wouldn't have this area uh, blocked if you like. If you wanted to experiment, you could um, cut something to fill in this area and then you could put uh, some brood, uh, sorry, some standard frames beside and collect some honeycomb on the edges. Or you could get one of our hybrid supers which is designed for that. Um, there's going to be an issue up the top here too. So you'd, if you wanted to experiment and put some conventional frames and mix it up in the top box, you'd, you'd create some kind of blocker here perhaps with some cutting some clear acrylic or you could use some plywood and also block up the top here and you could then mix it up in your flow super. Great and then I guess they've got the windows they can have a little sneak preview what's going on. Um, Cedar how do, can you tell when the hive is overcrowded? So with the flow hive it's, it's quite a lot easier to tell but you can simply open the side windows when you can't see the frame because there's so many bees which isn't the case in this hive we have a look in here there's actually there's been a whole lot of time with not much honey so the bees are a bit on the side of being a bit weak so having a look at that there's not many bees in this hive on the other extreme you can't even see the comb there's so many bees in there so if you're looking in the window you can't see the comb then you know your hive's quite crowded and they're likely to swarm in the springtime. So if you see that then you'll need to relieve some of that overcrowding uh, so they don't swarm otherwise you might not be able to catch that swarm and you lose, lose half your bees or if you're in an urban area that swarm could bother your neighbours etc. So good idea to take a split or, or find somebody who wants to take a split. There's always people looking for bees. They could get in here, take some of the frames out of the brood box and start a new hive. That way, relieve some of the congestion in your hive. You could also add another brood box or super and that would relieve the congestion as well. Right. So Kathy's, Kathy's asking, um, because their bees um, took um, left the hive, just wondering getting ready for next year and they'd already built um, some comb on the frames. Should they clean off that comb or leave it there for next year? 
Uh, look, it depends. You get different um, opinions from different beekeepers. Uh, if it's been sitting around, it's probably going to get wax moth in it and all sorts of things, so I'd probably knock the comb off and uh, start again. If you're using foundationless frames, you can just cut it out with a knife and the bees can start fresh from that. Um, you can, or you can insert new frames, whichever way you want to go. I, um, I'm not sure if you've had the flow frames on the hive uh, or not, but uh, you'll need to clean it all up, make sure it's, it's a, a nice environment for the bees, put your colony in the bottom again, look after them and they'll build up from there. And once they build up in the bottom box, you can add your super and hopefully this time you have much better luck. Susie's just asking, would you, do you need to wear a special suit to do beekeeping? Absolutely. So, so I haven't got one on today because we're not pulling the hives apart. But even if you're new to beekeeping, standing uh, close to hives, it's a good idea to wear your suit or, or at least your veil. Just as you get used to your bees and used to beekeeping, some hives can get aggressive and some people can be quite allergic to the bee stings. So until you really know your bees and know beekeeping, then wearing your special beekeeping suit, you can find them on our website, uh, is, a, is a good idea. And certainly if you're pulling apart the hives, if you look at last week's video, we were taking a hive split and you can see us there in our beekeeping suits inspecting the hives, if you're new to beekeeping, wear your gloves as well, which right. um, will limit the amount of stings you get. Great, Cedar, so our first time beekeeper. Um, another question, the, the, the girls were so close to filling the super and then they all of a sudden just stopped and now they're starting to eat the honey. Um, mm. Any advice on what's going on there? Bees are getting a bit hungry because there's not enough flowers around, so you'll just need to be patient, wait for the time when the flowers are, are coming back. If you're getting impatient, you can just take a little bit of honey. The flow frames allow you to do that. You can simply insert this key just a little way into the frame and turn it, and you'll get a nice jar of honey just out of a section of one of the frames, and you can leave the rest of the honey for the bees. Because after all, the bees are storing that honey for times like this when there's no flowers and they need those resources to raise their young, to warm their hive and keep their hive going. Great. See, a couple of people just wondering, any reason why we, we would, um, shouldn't have windows in our brood boxes? Um, no, it is a requested feature. Um, so it would be nice to put windows on the brood boxes and hopefully one day we will have that as well. It's nice to be able to look in and watch the bees in the brood box as well. At the moment we've got the three windows on the hive but to have them down there would make it five windows and I really find them incredibly useful but it's funny you know, um, conventional beekeepers you go look we've got windows on the boxes you can look into the hive and they go what do you need that for? And you go, well, it's, you know, it's a great learning tool. You can look in there going, oh, we just heft the hive, which is the term in beekeeping, to sort of get a gauge of your colony. And all they do is they come up to the hive and they give it a good lift and go, yep, that's heavy, it's full of honey. Or, oh, it's a bit light, it's not. So um, conventionally beekeeping's had no windows at all. And uh, the funny thing is you give them a box like this and after a while they're going, wow, that window's really useful. You can actually look in and see how your bees are going. Well, yeah, we told you that <laughs> the windows would be useful. And, uh, and, but yeah, the more windows, the merrier. So one day um, it would be nice to make that a feature as well. <laughs> oh, I've got to say goodnight to Fred Dunn. He's gone to bed now, so <laughs> <laughs> night, Fred. Sleep well. Um, Cedar, um, just wondering, someone's asking, is white ant fumigation harmful to the bees? So fumigation, as I understand it, is um, the process of when uh, perhaps woodenware has gone through a quarantine. And it's usually they do it for naked woodware that hasn't been processed. So you'll find that our hives are, are really fumigated because the, the wood's um, already been processed. is unlikely to contain uh, bugs and things. However, as I understand it, it's a gas 
I think it's some kind of bromine gas that's um, put into uh, the, the shipping container or area that needs fumigating and that's aimed to kill any insects living in that wood um, so they're not uh, getting into another country. And when that gas is um, removed or allowed to escape, then I don't think there's any residue left, so it shouldn't harm a hive. And the other one you talked about was uh, a white. I'm not sure what um, that's referring to. If you know the answer, put it in the comments. We've got time for one more question. Oh, all right. Uh, Brad, just wondering, said, is it necessary to have a smoker? And what is Darth? And I don't know whether he means Darth Vader or it's a B term. It's a B term called oh. D, it, um, uh, called D Earth or, or Dearth is, oh. is what it's called. So that's a, a time uh, when there's no flowers and no resources for the bees. So it's a term that gets used to describe um, perhaps there's a season, it's a winter, or perhaps it's in your summer, depending on where you are in the world, where there's no resources, no flowers for the bees. So they have nothing to collect and they have to survive purely on what they have in the hive. So um, that's what that means. And the other one was... About the smoker. The smoker, yes. Um, a smoker is a necessary tool in beekeeping. If you are doing the inspections yourself, you'll need a, a bee suit, your gloves, and your smoker and your hive tool. And the smoke is used to calm the bees. If you've got an exceptionally calm colony, you can not use the smoke. Um, however, do that when you're more experienced as a beekeeper. Um, if, uh, but most colonies, adding a bit, a bit of smoke will be the difference between uh, the, the bees getting quite agitated and stinging you or stinging your gloves or not. Um, so the smoke is definitely a, a good tool in beekeeping to calm the hive so you can get in there, see what's going on and do your routine checks for pests and disease. If we look after the bees then they'll look after us and the honey really is this amazing bonus. Thank you very much for watching. If you've got um, more answers to the questions below, by all means chime in. If you've got more questions, put them in the comments. I'll save them up for next week and I'll be answering them again.